blustery cold <laughs> spring day, but hopefully it'll warm up again soon. And I hear it's going to be 85 here in the mid-Atlantic next week. So it's about to like almost jet into practically summertime. So I'm Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor and publisher of Washington Gardener Magazine for the greater Washington, D.C. and mid-Atlantic area. So we cover from um, Southern Pennsylvania down through Virginia and out through West Virginia. And I'm being joined tonight by April. And April is who you see in this first picture here on this first screen. I'll put the pointer right her face. There's April. So, April, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I am April Thompson. I'm the director of marketing and sales for Bloom, which you're going to hear a little more about today. Thanks, April. So uh, this picture was taken, uh, you can see, on a, a much warmer day this week. <laughs> I think it seems like a long time ago, but I think that was Monday afternoon that we shot some video that we'll be showing you in a little bit at the community garden plot that I have. Um, so that's April there. All right, so we're going to dive into the first part of our talk is going to mostly about be about soil and soil health and then We'll take a Q&A break and then we'll dive into fertilizing and um, keeping your soil healthy tips. So we'll have a midway break for questions. Um, up until that point, at any time, if you want to put in questions on the chat or comments, feel free to type those in at any time and we'll catch up with them during the Q&A period uh, halfway through and then again at the end. So. I will now dive right in. All right, so our first, if I can get the slides to advance, there you go. So basics for building great soil. So great soil uh, is made up of organic material, oxygen, great water filtration. Uh, to help it along, you can add mulch, fertilizer, and then we need to know about soil temperatures. And the soil temperatures are added there just because I'm running into a lot of new gardeners um, this year and last year in particular who don't understand the principles of soil temperature and that planting depends mainly on the soil temperature, not the air temperature. So we pay a lot of attention, of course, to whether there's a frost and a freeze above ground, uh, but it's really the warmth of the soil and how warm it gets that tells us when a seed will germinate and also when a plant's roots will expand into the soil. So if the soil is too cold uh, and you planted a tomato plant out there today, even if the air temperature was 80, the tomato would just sit and not grow and not expand into the surrounding soil until the surrounding soil's temperature warmed up enough that the roots were comfortable enough to expand into that. So that's just to say that it's a good idea to pay attention to soil temperatures. You can look up soil temperature charts for your region um, on agricultural websites and just most weather sites will give it, but you have to kind of scroll down to even look for those and find those. It's not usually the top of the feed because um, everybody cares about wind and everybody cares about how much sun and rain and what the, the air feels like, but not as many people are caring about the soil temperature. You can, of course, also buy a soil thermometer yourself. It looks like one of those giant meat thermometers and insert that and get the soil temperature for your own uh, piece of land. But in general, you can check your area soil temperature for the average, and that's usually good enough. All right, so I'm going to jump on to uh, my first big piece of advice is to stop where you, whatever you're doing <laughs> and get a soil test. So that's the stop sign. So Homestead Gardens at their information desk has soil tests out in a little basket there. So next time you go to Homestead, I recommend picking up one of those. If you can't get over to Homestead, you can download soil tests from online and fill it out and then send it into a local soil testing lab and get the results back. So first you wanna know a baseline of what is in your soil before you add any amendments to it. Because basically you're exerting your energy, your time, your money, your resources um, into amending soil and not knowing what is in it or what it needs is kind of a waste of all of those resources, your time and your money. So 
at least do a soil test, uh, I would say every three to five years for uh, a vegetable or edible garden. Um, you could do every five to seven years for other gardens, say it was a woodland native garden or a rose garden or um, a perennial bed, but do it a little more often, obviously for your edible garden. All right, I'll jump to, <laughs> there are two types of soil generally in the mid-Atlantic region uh, that I hear a lot from readers and from customers of homestead gardens, which are, I have horrible clay or I have horrible sandy soil. <laughs> so usually it's one or the other. And it's funny the way um, the mid-Atlantic is divided. If you are from the area, it's almost exactly along I-95. So that's kind of the fall line for our region. So those that are on the left side of I-95 or we would call it the west side of I-95 tend to have heavy clay soils and those to the right side or the eastern side of I-95 tend to have more sandy soils. So both of those soils can be beneficial to plants and both of them have their um, not so great attributes. So with clay soil, the great thing about clay soil is it holds nutrients in really well. And of course it also holds moisture in really well. So that's one of the detractions of clay is that it can cause plants to rot from their roots because it is holding in too much moisture. So the one thing we need to add to clay is more drainage. So more oxygen, more organic materials. And then sandy soils are the opposite. So they uh, are great draining and wonderful for plant roots. However, they don't hold in nutrients very well. So you need to add more organic materials to sandy soils to get those nutrients to the root level. And the right hand picture is a uh, all American Soils exhibit that was at the Smithsonian and they had a different soil sample from each state in the region. And this section right here was the Mid-Atlantic. This was kind of like uh, Virginia to Delaware right here. And you can see most of it's clay, gray clay, red clay, orange clay, yellow clay, and then more sandy to um, the Delaware, New Jersey part here. And then the left-hand picture is just to show you what your soil should look like. Um, you want a good crumbly mix um, that's almost like a, the, I would say a chocolate cake mix. So once you've added your egg and oil to a chocolate cake mix, a store-bought one and mixed it up really well, that's kind of the, the texture that you want for your soil. All right, I'm gonna jump into one quick way we can amend our soils um, is lasagna or layer garden method. So if you have heavy clay soil or if you have really poor sandy soil, this uh, technique could work for either way. And basically it's to knock down whatever weeds are on the surface with a weed whacker or by pulling them and let them lay there, then do a thick layer of newspaper, which you could wet down with a hose immediately before the newspapers fly away on you, and then do a thick covering of any type of organic mulch material. That could be wood chips, that could be ground up, um, chopped up leaves like this is, it could be bloom that we'll talk about later. So any organic soil amendment in a thick, thick layer of like three to four inches deep. Um, and then what happens over the length of a season of about three to six months is the newspaper decays underneath, the soil microbes come up and grab this great organic material and they pull it down into the soil below. And when you're planting in it later on, which is my little zinnia row and marigold row here in my median strip, which was compacted, super heavy clay, salty soils from the salt trucks passing by, then you can have a uh, seed into it and have really nice garden soil. All right, so um, one of our big challenges, um, especially in the Mid-Atlantic, is improving drainage of our soils. So I just wanted to list really quickly some of the ways we can improve drainage if we have heavy clay soils, and that's to capture rain in a rain barrel or a rain garden or a green roof. We can also install a dry stream system, which is just basically piling um, river rocks 
um, and guiding the rain away from the planting beds down into another area of the garden. We can also plant more trees and shrubs so their roots absorb that stormwater and then replace any turf grass, especially compacted turf grass, with planting beds with native plants with deep roots and or perennial beds, um, anything that it has deep tap roots that would absorb more storm water than a typical turf grass lawn would. Okay, so our next thing that we wanna do for healthy soils is to cover the surface of any bare soil to retain the soil moisture, to cut down on weeds, and to improve the, um, nutrition capacity of the soils. So I just listed a few common mulching materials that we use. Um, we're gonna use straw, which is what we're using in the garden plot here, not hay. Hay is the one with seeds in it, and that's nutrition for uh, farm animals. Straw is just the stems of the hay. Um, chopped up finely and makes a good ground cover. You can also use pine straw or pine needles, or sometimes you'll see it under the name of pine fines. You can also use wood chips, and those can come from large size um, arborist chips down to tiny little shredded uh, chips. And then you could do chopped up leaves. You could either run over a bunch of leaves with your own mower and rake those into the beds, or you can purchase chopped up and aged leaves under the brand of Leaf Grow, and I'll show you a little bit about that later. Or you can use a soil amendment like Bloom, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. All right, so I just wanted to do a quick lesson about reading the bags. So here we are at Homestead, and I'm trying to decide what type of soil I want to add to a container or a planting bed. So the first thing I want to look at is, does it say soil on the bag or does it say mix? So you'll see over here on the left, it says actually organic potting soil. And you'll also see bags that say garden soil. So those actually have soil in the mix. There are other mixes, and right here is a Spoma organic potting mix, that have no soil in the mix. And that will be, you'll see that commonly for house plant uh, potting mixes, for seed starting mixes, and for say succulent and cactus mixes. Often they will be soilless mixes. Um, so that's one thing to look for in there. And you might also see that some of them have nutrition added to them. They might have fertilizer in mixed in, they might have other organic materials mixed in, and they might also have something called soil moist, which are the moisture retention pellets that are made out of plastic polymers, might also be mixed in with that bag. So um, when you're going to Homestead or your local garden center, be sure to read the labels closely to know what you get. So it's not a surprise when you come home and you open up the bag and you're like, oh, this is not quite what I was expecting. I was thinking garden soil to fill my um, raised bed, but what you bought was a potting mix that would be used for a large container instead. So definitely read the bags and look at the recommendations from um, the sellers there. All right, so let's go on to just talk quickly about leaf grow. So leaf grow is sold locally as a soil conditioner and you'll see that it says it's not soil, it's organic compost. And people use the term compost and mulch interchangeably because composted leaves can be used as a mulch material. They can also be used, like it says here, as a soil conditioner mixed into the soil. So that can lead to a little confusion, but just know that it is an organic additive that can be added in either as a top dressing or as a mix in to the soil. And I just wanted to do a side note about leaf grow that I'm hearing uh, that there's some shortages in the leaf grow supply chain. So um, get it while you can is what I'm gonna recommend right now. Um, I'm hearing already from people who are saying that it's, it's out of stock in some places. And this is just leaves picked up from the street um, pickups uh, in our local county and municipalities and then shredded up and then aged and filtered a couple times and then bagged up for your use. So 
you can do that yourself. So should leaf grow not be available or you um, want to try it yourself, you can gather your leaves in the fall. You can shred them up with a mower or other shredding uh, device, or you can just chop them up yourself and then you can pile them into a mulch pile here and then add some green material that could be grasses that could be um, plant stems that could be leftovers from your salads in the kitchen mix the brown and green materials together do a couple turns and then after a few months add those into your garden and then um, april i want to call on you to talk about uh how bloom differs from leaf grow or doing your own mulching at home and what it's made out of and how we can use it. Sure, thanks Kathy. Um, so bloom for people who aren't familiar is DC Waters biosolid um, soil amendment and fertilizer. Um, that uh, biosolids is uh, just essentially means that it's extracted from the wastewater. Um, it goes through a very sophisticated um, processing at Blue Plains um, that is then further processed um, at Homestead actually um, to, or at least for, for this particular product that we're looking at right now, um, to kind of com come with a, um, a concentrated fertilizer that has the benefits of um, a leaf compost and that it's got um, the good organic matter but also um, all of the, the macro and micronutrients that your plants need. Um, so that's available in bag and um, from Homestead. And then we also have some other products that are sold um, elsewhere and sold directly through us that act a little more like, um, like a leaf compost in that they you know, have wood fines mixed, mixed in with, with the fresh bloom. Um, so we have a, a few different um, products uh, available, but this one is a, a great all-purpose for, you know, if you're top dressing your lawn or incorporating into um, a garden bed, as, as Kathy and I did earlier um, this week. Um, and it is a slow release fertilizer. So that means that you're going to reap benefits over multiple seasons, as opposed to a chemical fertilizer that's kind of a you know, a quick shot for your, your plants. Um, the material in, in bloom um, breaks down, becomes plant available over time slowly. So kind of food feeding your plants what they need. I Thanks, April. Yeah, I was sure. just gonna say um, some of the members of the audience, I was just answering a question in the chat, um, might be familiar with melorganite um, and have used that. Or say fertilizing their tropical plants. And I understand that melorganite uh, is, sim is similar biosolid and that comes out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, hence the name mill organite. Um, and that has a higher um, uh, input, nutrient inputs, correct? I was looking at- Yeah, so that, that is, um, that goes through a heat drying process. Um, bloom, the, the, the process, at Blue Plains, essentially, it, it goes through what's kind of like a giant pressure cooker and then, um, you know, dewatering process. Um, but what sort of comes off the belt is, you know, still has a, a high moisture content. What happens then is that it goes through um, what we call a curing process, where it's essentially air dried. It goes through this very sophisticated process, only at the end to have, you know, this very low tech, you know, kind of air drying that happens um, right at right at Homestead. Um, and so uh, that versus, you know, melorganite's, um, you know, heat dried process, it just, it, it just results in a, in a much more concentrated product. So that, that's really the main difference um, is that there's actually, even though when you crack open a, a bag of bloom, it's kind of got the consistency of potting soil, but it actually has, you know, it still has a, a fair uh, amount of moisture in that as opposed to like the sort of like dried, you know, bone dry malorganite that you'll get. Hmm, thanks. And then I just saw that Scarlet Swan posted the same question to the Q&A. So thanks for bringing that up, Scarlet, as well. She just asked, is bloom equivalent to malorganite? So the nutritional um, analysis that I see is 1.5 to 1.5 to zero. So that's your NPK, correct? 
Yeah, and that is that's a guaranteed minimum as it's registered as a fertilizer. Um, you know, when you see those, that's that's what's guaranteed, but it's often you know above above two, two and a half, something like that for the nitrogen. Okay. I'm typing that in the chat right now so people can look at that nutrition label. So, because you're probably used to seeing fertilizers that might their NPK would be something like 555 or 5155, something like that. So this is a much lower but slow release fertilizer. And I, I, I'd say also, it, it, you know, by or adding the organic matter to your, mm -hmm. you're helping, you know, it, increase cation exchange capacity, you know, and things that can help decrease your, your need for fertilizer also. So um, we also um, have done studies, you know, with like um, University of Maryland, Virginia Tech, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that we've, we've seen in the research is, is drought resistant properties as well. Okay. Yeah. And that's a great point that you're, when you're adding additional organic matter, so it's also holding in water, it's adding water holding capacity and increasing the drought resistant. So we have a couple questions in the chat that is bloom made out of human waste from Beck and Rodney. And yes. So that's, that's putting not too fine a point on it, but it is a biosolid. Although the way I like to talk about it is it was that it, 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 it's derived from human waste, but um, it's really just a full circle, you know, we, we grow plants, the, you know, the plants feed us, you know, we, we poop that waste out and then, you know, it goes through this process where it is born again is something different. Um, and because of the really sophisticated process that it does go through, it, it really is something different at the end of the day. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to hit the, the thing. I was just uh, <laughs> fooling with my mouse, but I was just going to say that at Blue, it's produced at Blue Plains in Washington, D.C., and you do have videos at your website that, that show the process that it's created with and gives some of the um, uh, background and some of the calculations, correct? Yeah, we've got our um, full analyses, um, right on the website. Um, DC Water actually has the largest, uh, most advanced wastewater treatment plant in the world. So we have a type of processing equipment that um, we were the first in North America to put in place and um, don't have elsewhere at this point. Mm -hmm. um, that um, is, is a little different from, from some other biosolids, so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, eventually, we'll get back to doing tours and <laughs> can invite people in. Yeah, person. that was going to be my next question, April, is <laughs> when, we, when can we set up a tour? But yeah, watching a video or, or visiting your website to learn more is also good. So I'm going to go to the next slide, um, which uh, is the putting it all together. So these are going to be our couple of videos. So of creating a new garden bed using bloom and using um, garden soil. So those bags of, I'll flip back here, the bags on the left here of Maryland Select Organic Potting Soil mixed with bloom to create a new garden bed. So let's see if this time-lapse video works for you all. I'm going to adjust my volume a little bit. So this is a new raised bed, and the next video will explain a little bit more. All right, that, that seems super fast to me. I don't know if I should show it again, <laughs> but that was April and I creating the bed, and the next uh, video I'll, uh, Ex talk our way through it and explain it. Planting bed today at the community garden. And what we did was we started off with weeding out the winter weeds that came back from last year and left a layer of straw that we had wintered over there as a nice organic base for it. And then spread some arborist chips on the bottom. And then our next layer was good garden soil, mixed one part blue to four parts garden soil so about 20 percent bloom in the mix and this is for starting off a brand new bed and we did two loads of that in 
and we incorporated the bloom while it was still in the candy hauler or your wheelbarrow. It's easier to mix up in there and then add it into the bed than it is to mix it in the bed because then you'll be bringing up the wood chips and the straw and everything underneath. So that's one good tip to do is to pre-mix it if you can. And if it's an already established bed, you can go ahead and add a new layer of glue and maybe a new layer of garden soil and incorporate that in, in the top layer. Okay, so the relevant parts of that, and I'll go back to the other video to show it really quick again, the time lapse is that we did the mixing in a wheelbarrow or a handy hauler on the side rather than doing the mixing of the one part bloom and the four parts garden soil in the bed itself. That way we weren't digging up what was below it. And it made it a lot easier to do the mixing, I will say, uh, for the two of us to handle it ourselves. So I'll show that really quick again. And then we added that soil mixture into the bed in two layers. So I'll show this really quick again. So we're smoothing out the bottom, then we're adding the layer of wood chips, then mixing the bloom with the garden soil, then spreading that into the box or the garden raised garden, then doing a second batch to bring it up to level. And that was it. That was about, I would say April, it took us about half an hour all told to clean out the bed and create the new one, I think. <laughs> I'm trying to remember our exact timing. Yep. Okay. So uh, this was our midpoint question break, and I see a couple questions in the chat. Um, and let's see. Linda's asking, does the bloom product affect the overall texture of the soil? So maybe April, you can take that one. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the soil texture, I mean, that's, you know, your clay versus sandy, et cetera, mm -hmm. are, I mean, the, the pure bloom, I, I would say it's not going to, um, it's not going to dress, you know, it's not going to put your soil texture in a different category per se, but it is going to, for example, if you do have those compacted clay soils, it will help, you know, create more pore space. Um, we, you know, our blends, for example, we have a blend called our Sandy blend um, that, you know, if, if, you know, you have a, you know, a heavy clay soil that the sand is going to help with something like that is, is a good fit. So. Okay. Yeah. So it does affect it a little bit in that it adds some organic material. So it adds some holding capacity mm -hmm. um, for it. And I was but just in terms typing, of like the, the, the pure, like, is it going to move it to a, you know, mm -hmm. from a, a loam soil to a clay soil or what have you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not. So I'm typing down in the chat now, one part bloom to four parts soil uh, was the ratio we used for the new bed. Um, and that so is that's that's specifically for the bagged pure um, bloom. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using one of our blends that you know also has um, wood fines, you know you can kind of use a, a higher application rate. Um, and I, I I saw there was a question also about um, you know in terms of the wood chips you know robbing the soil of nitrogen and mm -hmm. with bloom you know there's there's enough oxygen. I mean I'm sorry enough nitrogen to 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 feed both. So it's, um, it is, yeah. it's not cannibalizing the, the nitrogen. Correct. Yeah. And so this is the bagged, I should have typed bagged bloom, not, not one of the other bloom mixes. And Linda asks, is it slimy? No, it feels just like um, any other compost material that you would get in a bag. So it has like a dry kind of, again, cake mix type form feel to it. Um, and it, that I, day, we actually have people moist. make the mistake of, of, thinking that it's potting soil because it is you know that that texture is not mm -hmm. what you might think it is um so that's true that it does feel like a potting like a loose potting mix so you might think that you can plant directly into it but don't do that don't use a hundred percent bloom <laughs> that would be a little much and then i missed one of the questions earlier before rob's rodney's questions about wood chips 
um, and the soil was, Beck was asking about top dressing around fruit trees and heavy clay soil. What is the best top dressing to use on the top of the soil? So we'll talk about, after this Q&A break, we'll talk about top dressing. So that will address Beck's question. And Rodney had asked about the wood chips robbing the soil of nitrogen. Recent studies have showed that's not the case. There was some initial uh, research that had people worried that the breakdown of wood chips was taking and binding up um, soil nitrogen, but they found it was just the top, top soil level and not from the plant's root level. Um, so that is not the case. So now they're actually recommending to use arborous chips or um, straight basically wood chips that that come right off the chipping truck is fine to use as a, a top dressing in the garden or to mix in with the soil and i think it's might be pat DeBoer. this is pst DeBoer. do you mix the straw and wood chips when you add the soil and blue mixture so no what what it was was the um old bed in the uh, the community garden had been wintered over with straw on the surface. So we left the straw there um, to keep down the weeds down below and then just added a layer of wood chips on top of that to add um, organic material and filler. And then we added the soil mix with bloom on top of it, but didn't mix it down into the straw and wood chips. So it's basically creating like a layer cake, leaving those bottom layers. And it was a good, I would say four to five inches of soil on top um so not into that layer um and ann says if you use bloom do you also need to use a regular fertilizer on a bi-weekly basis i'll let uh, uh april answer that uh, um bi-weekly yeah i would say i'm going to answer that a little bit when we talk about fertilizers after this q a break um okay about specific... I, I i guess i um mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take that because I, I typically don't fertilize on a biweekly basis. So. Yeah, because I'm going to say that it's going to, it depends on what you're growing. So not everything needs biweekly fertilizer or regular fertilization. And that's probably what I'll be answering in the fertilization part coming up. So that, that might be a little more clear there. Okay, I think we've got everything in the chat caught up. I'm just going to check the Q&A. Uh, really quick, is adding sand, uh, builder sand, beneficial to help loosen compacted clay soil? Ask Anonymous. So there's a lot of um, talk about that, that um, if you mix sand in with heavy clay soil, you basically create a concrete, almost compacted material because you're pushing out the oxygen and the sand is filling in the particle uh, places in the clay and making it even tougher to grow in. If you had a backhoe and could dig out your entire clay and put it onto some giant tarps in your backyard or front yard and then mix in a good ton of sand, then that would work. <laughs> so, But in the small quantities that we're doing for ho home gardening, that would be very tough to add sand in as a, an, amendment, an amendment. It's much better to add organic materials. Um, and that's what we had recommended here. And then Ronnie's asking uh, really quick. Yes, the wood chips are for aeration um, and drainage at the bottom of the raised bed. So that's why we did that layer down there. Because uh, I went, didn't want the soil to compact on top of the straw level um, and kind of get, uh, sometimes when the straw can get really wet and then it doesn't get oxygen down there, it might not, it might create an anaerobic situation. So that's why we did that for that. Okay, I'm going to go on to the second part of our talk. April, any more comments before I jump into the fertilizing part? I don't think so. Okay, I jumped into that and stay tuned at the end besides the q a at the end as well we're going to have a couple contests that we announce all right so this is answering beck's i think question this quick video is using bloom as a top dressing all right so we have an established healthy rose and you want to give it some bloom to amend and fertilize and you see down here already there's pine vines around it so i'm going to pull back the pine vines to add the bloom around it and we're going to do it in a proportion that's about a quarter inch thickness. So 
so a pretty light top dressing is what I would call it. So you're just going to kind of smooth it around and then put the fine fines or whatever your other multi material is back on top. Okay, so again, that was me, Kathy. <laughs> and I'm talking about uh, top dressing around a rose in this instant. It could have been any shrub or other um, perennial plant as well, or even a tree or a fruit tree. So what I did was I pulled back whatever the mulch was. So that could have been wood chips. It could have been straw. And in this case, it was pine fines. And then I um, scratched into the surface with my hands, but I could have used a garden tool as well. One of those like um, little rake scratchers you could use that to scratch in around the the soil around the base not too deep just a little bit to break the surface layer and then uh put a couple handfuls of bloom to use as a top dressing as it were and that same thing can be done in containers as it was around a plant in the ground and so that's a nice little boost um, for your soil around your established plantings um, so rather than digging up a plant and adding fertilizer at the root level, I'm top dressing it and then the soil microbes and little organisms will come up and bring down the um, bloom and the organic material to the root level. So I flipped already to the next slide, which is on using a slow release fertilizer. And this is at Homestead. The, uh, the brand that I like is Osmocote, but there's several other brands um, that you can look at. I like Osmocote because it's a coated pellet that is slowly released. It breaks down the pellet around it, breaks down over a series of a month to three months. And because I'm a super busy gardener, like a lot of you, I like to sprinkle the slow release fertilizer in my containers and around my um, plants and then forget about it for two to three months <laughs> and then do it again. So you'll see there's a formula for outdoor and indoor plants and there's a, out, there's a formula for flower and vegetables. The difference is in the NPK. So one uh, is higher in nutrients that promote leaf growth and that's the pink one. And then the one on the right is higher in nutrients that promote fruit and flowering. Um, so that's the difference between these two formulas. Um, but again, this is for gardeners who just want to do it once for the season, sprinkle the Osmocote on the surface around the plants, say in a container or a hanging basket or in a bedding plant of annual flowers and not have to bother with measuring fertilizer later on and, and with bothering with liquid fertilizer or any of the other formulas. So that's the, the great benefit of slow release pellets like these. So if you do like to be precise in your applications, um, there's a Spoma organic liquid fertilizer that Homestead carries. And what they've introduced in the last few years is this series of bloom, grow, and start. So start obviously is for plants that have just been put in the ground or in a container. And then grow is an all-purpose one and bloom is an extra one for pushing out flowers on annual plants. So they, they're trying to make it super, super, super easy for the gardening consumer um, and these needed need to be applied when you're watering. So liquid fertilizer, usually you're going to read the directions on the packet, but it could be something like a capful per one gallon in a watering can to be watered around the root zone of the plant, not on the foliage of the plant. So you're watering around the base with the liquid fertilizer. And as I think it was in Hilliard S earlier about bi-weekly. So this is something that you would probably be applying every other week throughout the growing season. Um, you could do it every time you water, but add a lot less liquid fertilizer. So that's one way that people who forget or you, you think, was that last week that I did the liquid fertilizer or was that two weeks ago? So sometimes you can forget, but so instead of doing a capful or whatever the measurement is on the container, you just do a weak formula, weak as in W-E-A-K, um, addition of the liquid fertilizer every time you water. So a weak solution instead of the full strength solution every two weeks. So 
whichever method works for you. And if you can keep track, even better. <laughs> so, and definitely read the instructions on the uh, packaging to make sure you're doing the, the correct ratio because more does not necessarily equal better. And sometimes you can do plants harm by giving them too much fertilizer, especially at the wrong stage of growth. And we'll talk about uh, the wrong times to fertilize in a minute. Um, then our next type of fertilizing is granular fertilizer. So they're the ones that are in these bags here. So you're buying bagged granule um, fertilizer and those similar to what we did with the top dressing with bloom around the rose, you would just kind of scratch in around the surface, uh, around the root zone of the plant. So Espoma, uh, at, which is carried at Homestead, has holly tone, garden tone, tomato tone. I can barely read these over here, but there's rose tone. So there's specific formulated granular fertilizers for specific families of plants. And garden tone is the general one. Um, tomato tone, obviously <laughs> high for fruiting plants. I tend to use garden tone for most perennials and other things, and then holly tone for my azaleas, roses, and other acid-loving plants. So those are the, the two main ones that I use. I also occasionally use tomato tone. And we'll go on to vegetables. So I like to use for my tomato plants, uh, fish fertilizer, and this is one brand, Alaska. Um, Homestead might carry other brands of fish fertilizer. So just look for the words fish fertilizer. Um, so you see it's NPK, it's high in the N. And it is literally fish fertilizer, as in uh, the, the byproduct of our fishing industry. Um, and that is a big byproduct of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they catch Manhattan. They basically chop up the little fish, ferment it. And that's the brown liquid that is inside this white bottle. And you're going to use just a scant capful according to the directions on the bottle and add that when you water the soil around your tomato plants, your peppers, your eggplants, and your potatoes. So this is a great fertilizer for um, the nightshade family in particular because it is high in calcium with all those fish bones. So this kind of harkens back to probably you remember in school um, when you were told about the three sisters gardens that our Native American um, uh, in the area grew and how they would bury fish or the fish heads um, after they ate a meal in the soil at the base of their plants. And that was the same principle as the, the fish fertilizer. All right, so talk quickly about fertilizing house plants. So um, house plants should not be fertilized all year round. You should be slowing off in fall, winter, and then restarting again in spring in general. The, the two big exceptions to that are orchids and cyclamen. So those actually need winter fertilizing, but the rest of your house plants kind of go into a dormancy. Um, so you'll start to slow off fertilizing in fall, cut out fertilizer entirely in the winter time, and then restart a, up in say March or so. Um, so those are my African violets, which I collect on the left. And what I wanted to show you in this horrible picture on the right, which is not very attractive, but what I wanted to show you is the accumulation of fertilizer salts. So that's what this is around the rim. And sometimes you'll see it around the bottom of terracotta pots, like that white ghosting um, around the bottom of pots. And you kind of see it here on the surface. So this plant has been in this soil for so long that the fertilizer salts have leached out into the pot material. And that is not a good sign when you see that white bloom um, or this kind of tannish bloom around the edge or around the bottom of the pots, because um, that means that they're definitely getting way too much fertilizer and that they need to be, the, the whole soil needs to be changed out. All right, so we'll go on to our next slide about top dressing around houseplants, and you can do the same thing with outdoor containers uh, using bloom. So I'm adding a little bit of top dressing of bloom around the root zone of this house plant as a slow release fertilizer. So that way it's not overwhelmed while it's just going to go into dormancy for the summertime, but still getting a little bit of nutrients and feeding 
is a very pot bound house plant. All right, so that was the one exception I was talking about for in the winter that was a cyclamen. So I fertilized the cyclamen all winter with liquid fertilizer every other week. And then for the summertime, I'm just giving a little top dressing of bloom. And then that's all it's going to get for the summertime because that's the dormancy period for cyclamen. Um, and they kind of just completely die back and disappear. So if you bought a cyclamen and it disappears and all the foliage drops off, don't dismay and think that it's dead. It's going to come back next fall for you. <laughs> all right, so um, we'll go on to when not to fertilize. So if a plant is showing signs of distress, if it's turning yellow or brown, or looks like it has any disease or insect or other issues, do not fertilize it. So what you're doing with fertilizing is pushing it to grow more and you don't want it to grow when it's in a state of illness um, or sickness. What you want to do is diagnose the problem first. You want to find out, is it drought? Is it root pot bound? Uh, is it an insect issue? Is it another pest? Is it not being watered enough? Is it being watered too much? So find out that issue first, address it. And when the plant is healthy again, then you will resume the fertilizing because um, you can do a lot more damage to a plant by trying to push fertilizer into it. And I know that's like, we think of it kind of as medicine or vitamins, and that is not the case for plants. It's not, not uh, the equivalent for humans or animals uh, to be using fertilizer for plants when they're not doing well. Okay, and then April. <laughs> Now is the fun part of our talk where we get to give stuff away. So, yeah. Yay. Um, so it being Earth Day, <laughs> we thought we would do a uh, giveaway of some red bud trees that have been grown in bloom. We actually have a greenhouse um, at Bloom Plains um, where we have um, a bunch of native trees we've been growing over the winter and have uh, three red bud trees to give away. Um, to basically to enter, so to speak, mm -hmm. since I know not everyone will have actually space um, or uh, have interest in, in a tree at this point. Um, you can just email me at april at bloomsoil.com and um, the pickup will be uh, from Northwest DC. So keep that in mind also, but mm -hmm. the, the first three people from from the event, after the event, uh, to, to email me. Again, it's april at bloomsoil.com. We'll put it in the chat. Um, we'll get one of these red buds. Great, okay, so April is gonna type that email in the chat, and then three lucky people will get a potted up red bud tree that will, I guess they will be planting in the ground this fall. We're not gonna recommend planting it now because of the coming cicadas. So we'll keep it, give it a little protection until the cicadas pass by. Um, and whoever wins will need to come and pick it up at their location in, is it Northwest DC, Washington DC, yes. correct, April? Yep. Okay, great. So go ahead and send her an email if you're interested in one of the red buds that have been grown in bloom. And that's just a red bud picture I took at Wheaton Park. It's just starting to leaf out right now. and the ending of the buds of the beautiful flowers. And I do see a couple raised hands and we're gonna to get to Q and A next. And that was just my five minute alarm that went off. Um, so we're right on time. So our other part of the contest we wanted to talk about and this April, if you wanna explain this contest. Yeah, sure. Um, so this we're launching today, uh, essentially a chance to win $150 um, Homestead Gardens gift cards. You can spend them whatever you like. Um, essentially, you are to purchase Bloom um, either from Homestead or or through us, depending on what kind of product you need. Um, grow something in Bloom. Take a photo and upload to um, a a form that you'll be able to to um, access after after this. Um, I th I think that Homestead will be sending something out to everyone who registered here. Um, okay, great. 
but yeah, so basic run means. through Labor Day so that we, depending on what you're growing, we'll have plenty of opportunity to see um, the final fruits of your labor with bloom. That's a, that's a good point. So the contest basically runs Earth Day to Labor Day. So I was showing some cherry tomatoes here on the left that I grew in so, with using some bloom fertilizer last summer. Um, so you just want to share a picture of either flowers or vegetables or any type of plants that you grew using bloom um, and then post it uh, according to Homestead Gardens directions, which I'll share with you. It might be on their Facebook page or it might be emailing that photo to them. And then you get a chance to win a $150 Homestead Gardens gift card. And I'm bummed that I can't enter this contest. <laughs> Man, that would be great. So just keep it in mind while you're growing stuff this season to, to take some pictures with your phone or a camera and to have those um, to enter by Labor Day. All right, so we're gonna go next to um, some local further reading and sources. If you're interested in learning more about compost um, and your soil health and fertilizing, you can check out my magazine, which is Washington Gardener Magazine. You can visit your local public gardens and ask them about their practices. Homestead also has an information desk available for you to when you visit the stores. And this is my contact information. Uh, should you have more questions after the talk, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WDC Gardener. On Facebook, I'm Washington Gardener Magazine. My podcast is Garden DC. My website is washingtongardener.blogspot.com. And again, it's Kathy Gents at Washington Gardener Magazine. Now we'll jump over to the questions that are in the chat. And I'm going to scroll backwards because I think, let's see, we got um, Beck's question about top dressing. Uh, should I use bloom as a top dressing for new fruit trees?